change anything. <laughs> so, hey everybody, thank thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, I'm Matt Payne, and uh, I did very little of this talk. I always enjoy giving talks with Aaron because he's fantastic, and I learn lots and lots and lots. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the chat, so if you have questions as we go, just type them into the chat, and we'll try to address them uh, during the talk, or if it's a big question, maybe near the end. So, uh, Aaron, do you want to say hello? Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Aaron. I'm presenting with Matt. Matt's awesome, by the way, as well. I feel like I right. reciprocate that. <laughs> and you are. All right, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> and uh, this slide, this next slide, is uh, you'll see this in almost any information security, information assurance, computer security, hacking kind of talk. You know, the first time I ever saw this was in the 90s when I took a networking class from Professor Wildman, and he said, look, I'm going to show you how to make uh, Ethernet packets. And so you have to sign this form that says you're not going to do anything bad with what you're going to learn in this course. So this is the same kind of thing. And this slide also reminds me of the story of Randall Schwartz, who's a famous computer programmer from the 90s. And Randall Schwartz uh, innocently was working for Intel Corporation, and he did some computer security things without written consent. And as a result, he was convicted of a felony. So not only should you not do anything bad with this information, but if you do use it, you should be sure to get written consent and things like that first. All right, I think I beat this slide pretty well. Um, there's this whole ethos out there in the world that's worth talking about for people who've not heard this before. Hackers is a term that started with the MIT uh, Railroad Club and all of the community that spun out of that. Stephen Levy even wrote a book called Hackers. That's just a fascinating read about the uh, founding of the microcomputer industry and the uh, computer industry in general. And hackers is a term of endearment, people who are doing clever things. Uh, there's been some effort by uh, Eric Raymond and others to coin the term crackers to note people who are doing bad things. Uh, but really, when it boils right down to it, hacking is a tool and how you use it determines whether it's good or bad. And so this is an informational uh, session that's going to show you some of the things that are possible just to sort of help you um, be aware. Let's do the next slide, please. So there's uh, several types of hackers here. You know, the people who are out there for nefarious purposes, I would call this the Kevin Mitnicks of the world, people who are bound to do some jail time and really not good. And then white hack hackers, uh, you know, you can actually get a job doing this. And, um, you know, it, the blue side, the defense side, trying to find the problems and uh, fix them. And then the gray hat, which is a sort of a mix. Um, and Aaron Schwartz, uh, may he rest in peace, was, uh, you know, one of these types of people. And I would argue that there's also uh, script kitties out there, which are people who, without really understanding what they're doing or how the tools work, just uh, run scripts uh, to two things. And this can be a, a huge, huge problem. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in future slides. All right, let's go to the next one. So uh, phases of hacking or breaking into a machine starts with uh, recon and then t taking what you've learned at recon and using it to form a plan of attack, then executing that plan. Uh, what's the old saying that no plan survives contact with the enemy? Uh, and then when you're done, try to follow the Boy Scout rule and clean things up and show that um, you, know, you weren't there. So let's talk about recon for just a moment. Uh, in general, it's nice to turn off all the informational banners that software have, like web servers and SSH servers and things like that. Well, frequently, just through sheer force of industry tradition, when you connect to them, tell you what they are and what version of the software they are. 
And if you do that, it makes it easy for people on the internet to do mass reconnaissance and collect all that information. And then when an attack or a script comes out that makes SSH version 1234 vulnerable, they can look up in their database and say, you know, who's out there that we can go with this? Um, yeah, John, you're absolutely right. Apache 221, for example. All right, so the phases of recon are uh, remote. You know, perhaps you're going to do some Google hacking where Google caches a lot of web pages and a lot of information. And as a result, you can find out about a computer system without actually directly connecting to it. Other tools that do this are Recon Next Generation or Recon NG, Bing, Netcraft, all can put together to give you this picture of a system. And you can get network information about their internet protocol ranges, domains that are used, email addresses, operating systems, on and on and on it can go. And all of this can be put together into a picture that will uh, give you lots of information to build that plan of attack on. And since it's remote recon, the target isn't even really aware that you're collecting the information. All right, let's go next. So direct recon involves directly connecting to the site is um, DNS zone transfers or running network map, etc. can be used. Those kinds of things are very uh, offensive and frequently will get noticed. And if they detect it, uh, you know, that can be a problem big time. So you want to go slow and steady. You can program these things to go at a leisurely pace and not knock anything over. I knew a place once where they would scan themselves and you could always tell that it was happening because certain devices would go offline like doors and security cameras and vending machines because they were scanning at a very aggressive rate. Um, all right. So there's, okay, good, good. So the plan of attack, now that you have an idea of what's going on, you have to choose a goal. And this goal is usually identified by a weak spot, a weak spot that'll give you some value. And then once you know that, you can start bringing in the tools. And Aaron, you're an expert on that. It's just fantastic. Let's go to the next slide. The attack itself, uh, or you're going to use these tools, you know, and you need to decide when you're planning your attack, you know, what's the minimum number of compromises that you need? What are your backup compromises in case those primary avenues don't work? What is an indication of success? Reading some, reading some data, or do you need to change some data on the a system that you're hacking? And when you're able to access the network and just listen, is that enough? That's considered a legitimate hack as well. Do you need to leave your way yourself away back in, or is one and done enough? Okay. And um, the movies, we could have a whole talk about hacking in the movies. You know? So <laughs> maybe that's for coffee time later. All right. So post attack cleanup, uh, you want to try to purge the logs if you can. Uh, and leave no trace, and there are tools that are going to help you do this, and, um, you know, so, John, you're right, there are tools out there that, you know, canaries, like a canary in a coal mine, you can leave it behind, and it'll let you know when something's going on on the system, so, let's see, um, and one of the things that makes it extra hard is remote logging with things like Splunk or Sumo Logic because those logs are sent across the network, sometimes across a wide area network to machines that you don't have access to. Next, please. So now here, here's, here's the, my favorite part of the talk is coming up here. This is the part where I learn tons and tons from you, Aaron, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, Matt. So, oh, first off, let me uh, show my virtual machines. I have three machines that we're going to be using today. Uh, Kyopix is the uh, image we're going to be trying to hack. We do not know the password on it. That's not a very good thing. So, our goal is to do this. This is what they call a boot to root situation. 
where we've grabbed a VM from a place, in this case, called VulnHub, and we're trying to actually figure out how to crack into it. It's a very simple uh, little task for it. So what we're going to do is we have Kali Linux over here. If you Hey, hey uh, Aaron, I've got a very important uh, status from the chat. Yes. So some people have been floating in, and I've been asked to reiterate the disclaimer. Yes. So the things that you're showing people how to do, you're doing it on an isolated, yes. uh, protected network, and people should be very, very careful to uh, not do anything bad with this. And also, if they are going to do it, they need to do it on an isolated, protected network or get permission from the powers that be. Yes. So thanks for letting me repeat that. Yes, definitely. Always, always, always show a great deal of uh, concern about it. So let's start with the first phase. That'll be uh, recon, which for that, we will copy the command. And we will run the command if it's going to. Actually, I'm not sure if it will let me offhand. We'll see if it will or not. No, of course not. So I've done just the basic MMAP. The one we have in the uh, demo is a little more uh, complete. It tells you like service version, stuff like that, and it controls the stuff. But we've got the information we need from it the way we've got it laid out. So what we need to know is what we're going to hack. So we see on the box, let me actually slip to the top of the next slide. The services uh, are available in the box are SSH, HTTP, RPC bind, NetBIOS, HTTPS, and something called FileNet. It's going by this on something called the Etsy services, which is a Unix type thing. Sometimes you can do a more in-depth analysis of it as well. An example being if we want to do and sometimes port numbers will imply services as well, such as 22 for SSH and things like that. Some people like to move their SSH servers for reasons just like that. So. So we're trying to do a little more in-depth scan here just to do it. And this gets us a lot more information. It gets us the version of OpenSSH, open the version of Apache, which is very old in this case, because this is a very old image. But something that still, they still exist out there on the net. And if you use a tool like a Shodan, if you haven't tried Shodan.io yet, you should try it. It is phenomenal. It's a scanner that goes through the whole internet looking for stuff. But So we see some possible, some potential interest here. So let's take a look at uh, HTTP. Everybody almost runs a web server, so you always want to take a look at web server. So let's run Nikto. Nikto, I'm running a Kali Linux, which is a really phenomenal uh, distribution of Linux. It's Debian with all the hacking tools built into it, so you don't have to put together your own set. If you take a look at it, we have like uh, information gathering, analysis, web application, all the basics, all the way down, version engineering, exploit tools. It's very, very nice. <laughs> Let's run Nick so dash H one I two one sixty eight zero one one two. And that is scanning against everything on the bottom, uh, everything that's running on port 80. And it's seeing like, uh, let's see, we've got some interesting stuff here. We got versions. Ooh, appears to be updated. Current is two fourths of percent. Uh, end of dates, end of lives, some potential interesting stuff here. And there's we have a data something on this machine called search exploit which will show up here and we'll put in one, three, 20. And it comes back with a whole bunch of interesting things here. These are all exploits that are ready to go and take a look at. We're not gonna use these, but here's an idea of how we can do it. So the uh, very, very cool stuff there. It is a lot of information. Keep in mind, all we need to have to consider the success, of, according to my rules of engagement for this one, is one successful attack. So any one of those could theoretically lead to it. We may have to change to additional work to get it. But let's keep looking because there's no reason to stop with just the first thing you look at. One of the things you do about recon is you necessarily, if it's time is not a constraint, you can see if there's a better way to do it. So let's take a look at NetBio Samba. For this, uh, we'll use an old friend of ours, uh, Ubuntu 11.04. Why Ubuntu 11.04 is 
So a lot of shops use Samba to create a low-cost file server that the Windows computers yeah. can use. Yes, it's uh, the implementation of the, it's the same thing as the uh, networking built into Windows. Come on. Yeah. And we do SMB clients. Dash L one two one sixteen zero one two. And it's funny about that is it's actually asking for a sum of password. Because if I run the same command, let me run this command over in the Kali box real quick too. So we can I can show you how it does work on that. Because normally it's nice to have just one machine you have to worry about to keep up to date and everything. And if I do that, it's going to time out. After a period, after a mm -hmm. brief period of time, because uh, it's using this machine is old enough, it's using an old version of Samba that uh, Linux has deprecated because they no longer consider it to be a valid uh, version of it because there were some security holes and stuff like that in it. Mm -hmm. So we just get into status IO timeout. We also run into this problem if you start doing this with uh, looking like old versions of SSH and some of that stuff as well. Web browsers they don't tend to do as much. Here's a little idea. But what we know here now is what we need. We know it's Samba 221A. So let's take a look for a data. Let's take a look for an exploit for that. There's Floyd. Samba 22. And we have a cornucopia of available options to us. Um, some of these are text files. Some of these are Ruby files, which are designed to run inside Metasploit. Metasploit is a framework which kind of makes it more like hacking in the movies because it really does a nice job because it separates the uh, tag code, the return code, all that into separate modules and stuff. A lot of people use that nowadays for actually handling the way the stuff works. So it, it's a very nice tool. Uh, Metasploit's uh, a friend of uh, Matt and ours, uh, uh, James Gorman, has worked on uh arm has worked out quite a bit and stuff like that it's actually a really nice tool so we have let's see uh towards the bottom about four fifths from the bottom there's a remote 10c remote code execution Mwah. that is what you want you always want remote code execution if you can get that so let's drop back to we don't need to be a root for this on the local box so copy user share Exploit DB, exploits, multiple, remote, 10.c, locally. Let's take a look at it real quick. Just always good to look at the code a little bit. So, first off, how many lines of code are we talking here? We're talking a thousand lines of code, which is not a lot of code, and a lot of that is documentation. Here's the uh, sections of the code that actually does the attack. It's just a buffer overflow type thing, but it has some decent documentation how it works. Mm -hmm. Let's compile it up. So 10, 10.c. Now we have an executable. Actually, let me go back to the slides real quick, make sure we're at to sync with those. And yep, we're right on schedule. So if we just run 10 now, what do we get? We get a small information warning about how to run run the thing. So let's run it. We are connecting to a Linux box. Actually, let me get to the next page before I get the right command. I right, was 90% sure I had it right. Zero, one, two, one, six, eight, zero, one, one, two. And we now have rid on the box. So let's, the first thing you always want to do is Get the password. Let's take a look at Etsy password. Between that and Etsy shadow, that gives you a lot of information about the box. Uh, we can take a look at user uh, oh, Excuse me. Actually, gives a version we're going against. That gives additional information. It's a very old version of a uh, Red Hat. Still... So once we once we have Etsy Shadow, uh, you could take that back to some place and perform dictionary attacks against it. Run password cracking utilities on yep. it. John the Ripper would be a fine thing, but we're not feeling that generous today. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just own the box the old-fashioned way. Password, and let's set it to info attack two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's the way we know it's good. But we have now changed the root password on the box. 
So let's go take a look, see if that actually works now. Yeah, so while while we're looking to see if this works, there's a great question that we'll elaborate on later if there's time, but I'll just give a brief answer now. The question is, is can some of these skills be used in situations where one is hired to fix a computer and the organization doesn't know anything about their own systems? And yes, 100%, once you have written consent, you can use these recon tools and network mapping tools in order to build a comprehensive picture of the organization's systems before you uh, show off by hacking any boxes, you should definitely uh, think twice and get your uh, powers of bees approval. So that is that is a great thing. Let, let me let me uh, let me elaborate that a little bit as well. I mean, obviously, you don't need to do all four phases. Uh, recon can be sufficient for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but sometimes uh, I was a, a company I used to work at. I ended up in a situation where it was like, we don't believe that's a true vulnerability. It's like, okay, let me show you. Then you run it, compile it, and then you show it, demonstrate it. And it's like, well, that's because you have intel knowledge. It's like, no, I have, you have to show the whole thing. One of the most important things about being a pen tester or doing anything with computer security in this response is the documentation of it. You have to keep track of all this stuff. Obviously, this is so simple that we can do it without any problems, but. So it definitely gives you an idea of kind of how it goes. But this is just, so now we own the box. Straight up, clean, happy, we can do anything we want to because we have roots. So we can actually take a look at anything on it. And one of the things about it is, if you ever look at like some of the uh, certifications like the OSCP and stuff like that, they will do something where you find a box on the edge that is not um, uh, really consider that important, but it has trust relationship with other machines, and you tend to chain through that to get more and more privileges. So you find something at the edge, some machine that hasn't been dealt with. In some cases, uh, printers are a very good thing to actually hit because they very rarely get their updates. And if you can hit that, then you have a toll, a foothold in the situation, and you can just do more and more over time. Because a real hack for a big company is going to take you some time. I mean, to do the documentation, to do an assessment, to do all that kind of stuff. Because it's not enough just, in this case, cracking one machine is all we cared about. But in the real thing, you're going to chain it to other machines and show how far and what you can do and stuff like that. Keep in mind, whenever you do this kind of stuff, there will be rules of engagement. Are you allowed to do this against production machines? What nets are allowed? And all that kind of stuff. Get as much as you can in writing. And if you're going to deal with a company, you're at all concerned about, I still would recommend actually talking to a lawyer and stuff like that, making sure. The problem is there's not a lot of great lawyers from that standpoint, but just uh, to handle it from a good faith thing. I had a, a piece of paper from a company I used to work from saying, Mr. Grothy is allowed to do any hacking necessary in the performance of his job. And that lasts until the next CEO. <laughs> the next CEO revised that quite a bit. So mm -hmm. quite simply, we own the machine now. And how, how long did that take? Just a couple minutes. Why? And, and the way... The way you did that is you did the recon yep. and you found a list of vulnerable software or potentially vulnerable software, right? Yep. And and then you got the versions of that stuff and then you ran the versions through search search exploit and search exploit matches the versions to well-known exploits yep. and you found the 10.c 10, 10 and it looked really good because it was remote code execution, right? Yep. Yeah, search exploit comes with uh, Kali. It's also available separately, but if you actually like, we looked at the version of uh, SSH, we can also theoretically go after that and see what the mm -hmm. options are. There's not really a good one. Uh, command execution. Command execution gives you like one shot. You can run one command against it, but that one command, if it's something uh, that you have set well enough, can really do the job for you. So, so that's just an example of how much you can own a box that would be a big issue. So, success. I, and, I, and this is like the first time in probably the last six months I've had a demo go right, so I'm very, very excited. <laughs> uh, there's some caveats we need to share about that. Um, we already mentioned this before, but this is always one that bears repeating. That box, there were multiple ways into it. I just picked the Samba one because that was a pretty easy one, and I've run that exploit in the past. Um, the Defender has to protect all the openings because you saw what Nikto came back with. There was a lot of stuff in there. If we went back and wanted to dissect that uh, a bit more. We ran this against it and found the version of Apache 1320 
there are vulnerable, yeah, all sorts of stuff available to it. Ooh, remote possible code execution. Some of these uh, exploits will just crash the service. Some will actually let you do more. One of the things I like about Samba is it always run, usually runs as root, unless it's a very well segregated version with blackouts or SE Linux and stuff. So there's stuff. Keep in mind, I was attacking one company. I was being paid for it. It was a, all uh, very well done. I spent a day and a half attacking the machine. And at the end of that day and a half, I'm like, this is a honey net. <laughs> a honey pot machine. A honey pot machine is a machine you set on the network that looks vulnerable, has no capabilities to talk to anything else. There's a, a gentleman, Fred Cohen, uh, Dr. Fred Cohen, a, a person that um, I, I know a little bit. And he um, went, to, he, he's put together the deception toolkit where it actually lets you fire up services and stuff like that. But it's, uh, but it was a very interesting thing, but it came down to they were not clear about that. I had found other ways in, so it wasn't a big deal, but I wouldn't have wasted near as much time on it. Um, so yeah, the defender has to protect all openings, all the attacker has to do is find one. The attacker can change attacks. And the attacker also doesn't care about things like bringing down your network necessarily. If they they care about a little bit because they don't want to give you more and more uh, evidence to form a case against them or get a sign that you're being attacked. But they, for the most part, they're pretty well okay with going at stuff. Um, we made no activity to hide our activity during our hacking session. The Samba stuff, client activity should have been logged. It would have been logged in a, a, a decent company with that, that kind of stuff in place. Um, one thing we did was we changed root password. So whoever tries to log into that machine as root next is going to go, hey, something's wrong here. The way a smarter person does it is they will uh, change root password, do all their work, then change root password back. And usually they'll create a, a, another account for themselves with root privileges. Keep in mind, we also mentioned the disclaimer before, and we'll mention it again. Don't do any bad stuff with this information, please. So, um, so yeah, if this is a real thing, I'd add a user with the privileges of the system be a lot more subtle. Uh, one of the great things you can do is uh, sudo has some tremendous capabilities into it. You can actually create stuff that's very subtle inside that because not a lot of people really read the sudo uh, syntax until the next time the machine gets patched and it creates an RPM new of a CentOS box. It'll probably be okay. So clumsy yet effective this hack was. Now I'm talking like Yoda. Um, Aaron, you, you are a Yoda, that is for sure. And I think that we're supposed to have a hard stop at uh, four. 345, four. which is two minutes so from now. We're four o'clock, aren't we? I don't know. I thought we had till four. No, we started at 315, man. So, yeah, till four. Okay, so we'll go to four. We'll go to four. All right, well, never mind. Yeah, we got to You know, so, so uh, since I interrupted you, I'll ask you a couple questions. Like, you know, this is the scenario where uh, a company is, has some computers and they're completely ignoring them. They're not keeping them up to date. They're doing pretty much every single thing wrong. And so they have these old unpatched systems and someone can wander in and, uh, you know, look out. If someone used these recon skills that you've shown us to map out the network, then the organization would know we have to patch these things. Look at this. This Samba thing has a remote code execution. We need to patch it first. Yes, yes right? triage though is important. Yeah. Keep in mind, uh, any decent company also have a firewall, so it'll prevent certain, it won't allow just regular machines out into the net. I mean, the, the, a Kyoptics machine hopefully won't be on the net for a lot of stuff. But if you play something like Shodan, you will see some stuff that is scary. And keep in mind, if you are a good Samaritan and you tell a company that they have open printers on there, you may not get the response you expect, which would be a thank you note and a job offer. You may get a very nasty cease and desist letter with a threat lawsuit from a large multinational company, theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone's curious on how to break into this kind of work, uh, what would you recommend? You know, some local computer clubs or some YouTube channels or books? Uh, YouTube channels and books are great. Uh, we got a couple resources we talk about a little bit later on in the certification part. One of the ones we talk about is great. Hack the Box, and uh, we also talk a little bit about WebGoat. WebGoat is phenomenal. OWASP, there is an OWASP chapter. They, they haven't been having their meetings lately, but they are very good, very, very good, smart people. John Rogers and the rest of the team are really good on that stuff. Let me see what I got on this one. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Keep in mind one thing uh, with Internet of Things, 
systems are not going to be getting patched to see a big resurgence in this style of hacking because there's really two types of hacking at this day and age. One is the kind of this approach where you go after the system and stuff like that. Then you go after the applications through uh, application errors through the web server having issues with like not doing sufficient uh, validation of inputs and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, there's a friend of ours, Ron Warner, who does this talk like security, we haven't learned anything in 20 years. He has a better name for it than that, but it, it comes down to that. And we still talk about the most common attacks uh, being things like SQL injection and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it, that's something. I, 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 like to, I like to believe there's hope. Just, just the other night, my wife and I had a conversation and she said, oh, the smart things network just went down. And I said, it's probably patching itself. And a moment later it came back up. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, happiness. Yeah. So uh, how do you learn hacking? Let's go over that real quick. Uh, we talked a little about WebGoat. WebGoat is just a Java jar. You just have to fire it up. It's based around the OWASP top 10 list. A couple of the highlights are injections, broken authentication, cross-site scripting, use components with known, known, known vulnerabilities. WebGoat will get you a good background in this. It definitely gives you a whole nother approach towards that stuff. It's a really simple little uh, environment. And uh, it has, it, it, I recommend it highly. It, it, it runs on your local machine. You can run it on Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever you want to. And they have the lessons and they explain to you how to do it. And once you get through that, you'll have a lot better idea how hacking works. Not at the system level like we did for our, exa for our example here, but for how it works at the application level, which is technically, I think, more important nowadays, the way stuff goes. So WebGo recommended highly. It's done by OWASP, 100% on that. Uh, another site is hackthebox.eu. It's a great resource that has free and commercial tiers. They offer virtual machines to pen test and learn with. They have rules, contests, all sorts of stuff against it. Um, the funny thing about this is, and I love this about their site, to get an invite, you have to hack their system. So uh, they actually tell you to, you have to hack it, which you end up opening up Control Alt F12 and just uh, getting the console open and start calling JavaScript functions until you find the right one. I spent a time, a bit of time with this the other day, got the invite, so I've been playing with them a little bit. I like their stuff. Um, they do have, a, a, they offer like 25 machines you can hack pretty much any time over VPNs and stuff like that. And then they have like 110 their old system stuff. Really good stuff. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, great resource for that. Um, one of the things I recommend is you grab a hacking ISO or VM image and build a VM with that. You do not want to install these tools on your regular machines. If you have an old machine that's around, uh, that works great as well. Kali Linux at the distro we were showing earlier. Kali has about everything you could need to make you uh, learn how to work better. And you're using VirtualBox, yes. which is free yes. for personal use. But it has all the basics in it. It's, it has everything you need, and you can just put, pull the additional components into it you want to. It's a great tool. It talks about social engineering stuff like that, which we don't talk about all this talk, but because we're not really that social. But um, Kali is also used in Mr. Robot, so you know it's got to be good. Uh, there's other par distributions out there. There's Parrot, there's Pentu, there's Black Arch, there was uh, Nopix, STP, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, Kali Linux Reveal is a really nice introduction to Kali Linux. Uh, if you do a Google search for the following, Kali Linux Reveal extension colon, uh, semicolon, uh, colon PDF, It'll point you where you get a copy of it. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit of Google hacking, by the way. If you really want to know how to hack, do recon better, Google hacking will really help you get there. Because that's uh, the best thing you can do is put together as much information before you actually hit the site you're actually going to go after. So that way you have as much information in your portfolio as available. You have as many ideas. You have to spend a lot less time actually going after it. Uh, Volnhub is a site where you can get hackable virtual machine images. That's where we grab Kyoptics for this, the one we use for this. They have a lot of examples of boot to, boot to rid it images. That's an image where it just boots up and you just go at it until you get rid on the box. Some have other things like you uh, are supposed to capture capture like three files of information. Think about if you're going after a bank, you know, getting a bunch of credit card information is probably what you want, account information, that kind of stuff. So there's different rules on it. Keep in mind, Volnhub does not necessarily validate their images 100%. So keep that in mind. You may want to keep them on a separate network, all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I want to talk a little about as well is certifications. Um, there's several certs that are pretty well accepted in terms of uh, cert, uh, to say that you're pretty good at hacking or that you have the, the domain knowledge to be able to do it. There's OSCP, which is the Offensive Security Certified Professional. It's by Offensive Securities. These are the guys who support uh, Cali Linux and Metasploit. 
Uh, it's course followed by a 24 hour exam that requires you to hack like seven machines, I believe. Their motto is try harder. <laughs> It's supposed to be a bear of a cert, and it's also recently been updated. I've never uh, uh, sat for this exam, but I'm actually thinking about it right now. So there's that one. There's Pen Test Plus from CompTIA. It's a nice little exam. It's a lot less uh, effort. Uh, it's multiple choice with some scenario type questions. They have some good books and stuff to help you study for this one. If you've taken a CompTIA exam before, you pretty much know what to expect. I took the beta years ago, and I, I found it to be a challenging little test, but I passed, of course. Fortunately, uh, they're certified ethical hacker. This is by the EC Council. This is training combined with a certification exam. Uh, I know some people who have have the certification. They have good things to say about it. Uh, if you work on base or something like that, deal with the uh, DOD. This is one of their uh, accept, accepted um, hacking standards, so it's actually quite good from that standpoint. Uh, GIAC has a bunch of specializations the area of pen testing, hacking. GIAC is liked by a lot of people. I recommend SANS stuff a great deal if you can uh, afford it. It is very nice. Uh, Cyber IT has a pen testing career path. It combines uh, training with their certification stuff. Uh, parts of it are free and some of it's fee-based. I've used some of their training in the past and it's pretty good stuff. I mean, it varies, of course, like everything does, depending upon who the instructor for that section is, but I've liked it. I used them uh, several years ago when I was getting my IDLE certification. They helped out quite a bit on that. Uh, do you need a certification to be a hacker? No, but it can help if you don't have the experience. It can also help make sure that you're exposed to all the parts of it. Another thing is uh, all these hacking uh, certifications have a code of ethics and stuff. And if you sign off, sign up for that, they tend to say that you tend to be more of the white hat camp than it just being some guy we find on the street or through Fiverr that we're trying to get the hacker stuff. So that can definitely help out, but it just helps make sure that you're exposed to all the parts of it and stuff like that. So I, I recommend the certifications to look into and we can help you get the next one. Uh, the cyber IT one was pretty cheap. So that would be the one I'd probably start with, but it has a lot of stuff in it. So it comes down. To much. So as, as, as a, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Aaron, uh, but I'm doing it anyway. So there's a fantastic question from Tony about how much opportunity is in the area of, uh, hacking, white hack, hacker, information security, and things like that. You know, some people say that there's there that the amount of opportunity in this area is only second to the amount of opportunity there is for software developers. I've heard that. Uh, there's this, I can't remember the poll right now. If you look for cybersecurity jobs, uh, references and stuff like that, you got to Indeed and stuff like that, look for pen testing, there's a decent amount of stuff like that. It's not a bad career path, to be honest. It's uh, one I've, I've been down this road before, and I might be going back down this road again. <laughs> Things go. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of companies in town that have security operations centers where uh, you can get your start, and uh, you know OWASP and other local groups will also help you. So it's a great career path, only only second to software development, which is better. <laughs> Yeah, it comes down to how, how puzzle oriented you are in some ways. It, it, keep in mind, pen testing, uh, it looks far more exciting than it can be at times because keep in mind, it is a job. You will be, if you're doing pen testing, you will be putting together reports a lot. You'll be doing this, you'll be doing that. It won't be like you've got 16 monitors around you like uh, they did in Swordfish and you're hacking at uh, four in the morning. You may be, but it's not probably going to be exciting. But it's a job. But it comes down to the fact you're helping, uh, if you're a white hat hacker, you're helping companies figure out what their uh, next steps are, help them protect themselves and that kind of stuff. So it's not a bad job. I mean, you can be on the white hat side. It can be uh, pretty rewarding. So I reckon I, it's, it's a very, very good on the white hat side, black hat yeah, jail. Is jail can fun. be very bad. If you're on the, keep in mind, even some people like the dread pirate robbers only made one mistake and that's all it took. If you make one mistake, if you're doing something wrong, you're going to eventually forget to log into Tor one time, leave a wrong password, leave to have an accountability of your language you're going to eventually going to get nailed hard. But this this is also an evolving area as well yeah. because of things like uh, AI, ML are factoring into it. But a lot of the same concepts can continue over because we're making the same mistakes. So, yeah. Also, there was a really great question about using Shodan to find vulnerable home Wi-Fi routers and things like that. And, you know, when I type in uh, Orbi into Shodan, I get some hits. So apparently some people have not been keeping their Orbi systems yeah. up to date. So, yeah, Shodan is a yeah. tremendous tool. I recommend that. Shodan, Kali, WebGoat, 
between those three, that'll get you a big chunk of stuff. And Starberry IT, those will get you a big chunk of what you need to start figuring out. I just, one of the things, let me go back, actually, this kind of the sl summary. Um, and testing, hacking are interesting. I've spent a great deal of time on it over the years. I've always, find it's when you finally get the root, you get the, the, the piece of information you need. It's kind of a release of endorphins there. It's kind of, you can figure out a puzzle, you solve the Rubik's Cube kind of stuff. One of the reasons why we're doing this talk yeah. is because we'd like to have everybody have some basic knowledge about how hacking works and how to hopefully be more secure. Because things like patching your systems, obviously, Matt, is, like you mentioned, is incredibly important. Because if this Red Hat uh, box had been patched, would, it, would I have been able to hack it? Probably because it's no longer being supported. But it would have been a lot tougher for me to do it. So that's good stuff. And we want to make sure right. people have an idea how it works in terms of uh, recon, planning, attack, and cleanup is pretty much the four steps. So we're looking for Yeah. My, my hope for this talk is not only to inspire people to go into this line of work because it is a great line of work, but also to inspire uh, people to uh, work politely with their companies to ensure that their companies have an information security posture and, you know, have some professionals who are either on staff or maybe come in for consulting engagement in order to map things out and reduce that attack surface either by updating the versions of the software or using firewalls and things like that. So that's yeah. that's my hope. So that's pretty much our talk. Uh, we got a couple minutes if there's any questions. Is there anything else in the questions that looks interesting, Matt? Uh, I, I, I don't see it here, but I think someone asked a question about using Python for information security work is yeah. Is that like a up and coming uh, thing for information yes, security? Yes, there's a great book use? called Gray Hat Python, which goes over how to write exploits mm -hmm. and uh, attacks in uh, custom attacks inside Python using it. It's a very good book. It's about three, four hundred pages. It's a healthy read, but it's got a lot of stuff in there. You don't have, don't have to do that much stuff. Um, one of the things I'd recommend if you want to look into actually getting into the exploit side is I hate to say is learning Ruby. I'm a Python guy, but Ruby is one of the metasploits written in. And it's a, yeah, Ruby's, Ruby's awesome. good. Yeah. I just, I prefer Python. But um, there's the, the, the thing about metasploit is it, it broken up into parts, the attack and stuff like that. It's a very nice toolkit for that. But people do write a lot of uh, gray hat stuff in Python. Uh, John Kennedy did some attacks against some web servers years ago that uh, he did in Python, which were pretty impressive. So, so there's uh, two, two more things from the chat. One is uh, I thoroughly agree with you, John, that things are constantly changing and you always have to stay up on things. So even if it's a small company, uh, you know, finding some information security professionals to consult with from time to time to keep things up to date is important. And then also here at Infotech, it's important to get feedback from the audience. And so you'll notice that there's a uh, chat message that is pinned from Tony that reminds everyone to please take the survey. There's a bit.ly link right there. So um, please take the time to do that. We want to hear what what you have to say, you know. Um, yeah, thank if you, you have any uh, follow-up stuff, uh, Matt and I are both on LinkedIn and uh, hope you had a good time. Can Hey, before you go, yeah. do you guys have anything you want to plug? I know CSF is coming up next week, right? Yeah, uh, next week, uh, Nebraska CERT, which is a group I'm associated with, has our uh, joint meeting with uh, ISC Squared Omaha and a bunch of other groups. It's uh, We're having four people up front, and we're asking a whole bunch of questions of them. It's going to be a good time. NebraskaCERT.org slash CSF for that. It's Wednesday over lunch, free event, uh, virtual, of course, and uh, it's, a, it's a good one. Yeah, and the yeah. CSF is Cybersecurity Forum. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, if you're interested in that, uh, I, I run the... Uh, well, I'm one of the people who runs the Nebraska CERT in Omaha, which is uh, a security group we meet like 10 times a year, and we always have a bunch of stuff. If you hit our website, we have a bunch of our old talks and stuff out there, too, some good stuff. I have one about Metasploit that's actually pretty good. How about you, Matt? I'll plug MidwestDevChat.com. It's a great Slack community that you can get a free invite to. It's not just Omaha people, but it's all areas of interest. So, um, you know, this line of work is not, uh, about sitting in a basement alone, drinking too much <laughs> caffeine. It's really about connecting with people and learning from each other. So come come join the community. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you both. And uh, everybody, as you saw Tony's notes, um, 
they're going to be in the main stage here after you've done your survey. So thanks for joining us for this session. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Thanks, John. Welcome. Thanks. thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Aaron. Bye. Yeah. Yeah.